Hello, hello. Good morning. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the members of the Book Festival Committee, and it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend Steve Shepard. Steve Shepard is a writer, musician, and songwriter. In addition to his two novels, Taurus Town and Nantucket Nocturne, he's written for the Boston Globe, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Providence Journal. For eight years, he was the editor of the original Nantucket magazine, dedicated to the history, people, and culture of the island. He began his journalism career with the Nantucket Inquirer Mirror, and also worked as a reporter for the Patriot Ledger and sports editor for the Nantucket Independent. I first met Steve in the 2018 local author's tent, <laughs> and he graciously, graciously exchanged books with me. And in my copy of Taurus Town, he signed his name and he wrote, I hope this reminds you what you love about Nantucket. And it did. Steve is in conversation with John Stanton, a newspaper reporter at the Inquirer Mirror, editor of the magazine Nantucket Today, and documentary filmmaker who just the other day returned from shooting a film in Belfast, Northern Ireland. So welcome, John and Steve. So um, I have a loud voice, but I'm being told we have to use these mics for the television. Um, whenever I hear Sheps, whenever I hear your, your, your litany of uh, places you've worked, um, I, I always try to, re you know, it's important to remember he was also a weaver, opened scallops, drove a tour bus, played guitar, sang in bands. If you've never heard his film Tourist Town, ask him later, he'll probably send you a link. And um, in all of those, all of that comes out in your characters, right? Uh, yes, uh, as, a, as a matter of fact. I, I hadn't even um, thought about that, but um, in the both books, uh, one of the characters drives a tour bus, um, and that character in the second book eventually lands a job uh, in the, on the weekly newspaper. Um, don't know where I got that idea. <laughs> and that... <laughs> Actually, that's a, it, what is in the book is true. It is exactly what happened to me. I was uh, at the Nantucket Looms, and we needed to find a winter rental. And so I went to the newspaper, I'd never been there before, to put in a classified ad. And for some reason, don't know why, I said, you wouldn't happen to have any job opportunities here, would you? <laughs> and the minute I said, I said, why did I say that? And, and uh, it was Joanne Troy, and she said, yeah, the editor's right over there. I think they're looking for a reporter. <laughs> and I walked over, and, I, and I, I walked out with a job. Come to find out, the person I was replacing was, started work at the Nantucket Looms Monday as a weaver. <laughs> so. In those days, uh, the newspaper was going out in the street and just grabbing random people and dragging them inside. I, I guess so. <laughs> right. there's, an, there's an old joke from the old days that uh, two guys go to apply at an old newspaper in the 40s, and uh, the editor goes, uh, which one of you can read? And one guy raises his hand, and he goes to the other guy, all right, you're the photographer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they come out in your, I mean, Clarence Digit Hathaway, yes. is, to me, is a typical uh, is a typical Nantucket guy that would be sitting next to you at the chicken box on a three o'clock on a random Tuesday. Well, that's and that's kind of where he came from. From you know working at the newspaper, being out and um, you know interacting with a lot of people, um, they, they kind of all filtered down to this character Digit, who's my uh, uh, speaks for Nantucket. You know, and he does. He speaks for the Nantucket. That's the Nantucket we all know. Not the, uh, not the summertime, right? Nantucket's a mirage, really. It's all things to all people. There's a summertime Nantucket with million dollar houses and f fabulous parties and high end restaurants. And then there's guys like Digit, who are smart enough and, 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 uh, and they understand their sort of legacy here, but they're, uh, they're islanders, right? They're just trying to hang on. Right. In, um I mean, and, and that's it. I mean, they just, but what comes through, I hope, in the books is they're, they're not just trying to hang on, but their, their love of Nantucket is what is um, kind of their reason for being, and uh, that they feel fortunate 
uh, to be here, and, and Digit especially feels fortunate to, um, you know, be a X generation Nantucketer. In, in the beginning of the book, he, he's thinking of his great, 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 I think, is it three or four great grandfathers who was a, a whaling captain. And from that, you know, he thinks that he's a scalloper. So I kind of was making the maybe a parallel between uh, uh, scalloping and whaling and, you know, how it's people still making their living from the sea, even well, though it's closer by. Well, and you told me once, I mean, last time we spoke, it was at the chicken box, I think. And you told me that... I've never, I've never been to the chicken box. How could, how could that have been there? Yeah. I don't even know where it is. But, um, but you told me that you thought that the characters in here were in a Nantucket that's sort of out of time. I mean, yes. they're, not, they're not in any specific era. But they no. really seemed like us when we were that age. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I remember I called you a lot, John. I was asking, uh, what, was, what was that we did there? Yeah. Um, uh, one thing I want to say before we go is... Uh, um, I want to thank John for being, I want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to thank everybody with the Nantucket Book Festival for this. It's just so wonderful. Um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, talk about ex an exchange of ideas, um, and just to go to these talks and to, and to hear different people and, um, get a different point of view, and what a, just a, a thing in these, in these times to hear different aspects and hear different stories. And um, I don't know if, you know, if we're, you know, it's just, it's a great thing. And plus, free and open to everybody, and it's just a wonderful thing. So thanks so much. So, so let me ask you, uh let me ask you this. So in Tourist Town, which actually made me laugh out loud in several parts, which I hardly ever do when I'm reading, um, and, and, and it, had that, it had that Nantucket kind of humor that, that is difficult to define. Um, why carry these characters over a few years later to the next book? And then do you plan to do that in, the, in, in another book? I uh, know the, uh, the book I'm working on now uh, is about Nantucket, but it's totally different characters. And, um, and the reason I carried them over into this book was I felt uh, that their stories really weren't told yet, that there was more to, you know, in, at the end of the first book, uh, Verona, who's the main character, is really um, coming to grips with her identity and her life, and I just couldn't leave that ha hanging. And so I... Um, but one of the things of doing that is, you know, you're writing the new book and you're like, no, wait a minute, how old is this character? And in fact, um, Karen, who's my first reader, my, my wife in the back there, and, oh, happy Father's Day, everybody. <laughs> um, she was saying, now, how old is, is uh, this character? And I'm like, gee, I never thought about that. I better... So, that's why in this new book, I'm like, I'm starting from fresh and starting with, <laughs> starting with new car. I even got a guy coming in. He wanted to retire to Martha's Vineyard, but they're making him come here for a job. <laughs> well, I mean, I thought it was a great idea because the beauty of this island, as we've all experienced, is, you know, once upon a time, it, it was different, and then it got, things changed. But the people in the middle, the people stay relatively the same, although you hope that you get a little older that you can get past your mistakes. Right. That's not always true. No, no. Um, speaking of my wife, too, uh, isn't it funny that we, we met through reading? I was the manager of a bookstore, and she walked into my life. She walked into my bookstore and into my arms. <laughs> what, um, Talk about the idea of, and we've talked about this before, but talk about the idea of a self-published book. Now, there's yep. pros and cons to it, right? Our, our mutual friend, Steve Axelrod, yeah. who's a writer, likes to say that an unpublished book is like an uncurated museum. Um, did, you, do you, did you feel that, or did you feel a f sense of freedom to be able to do what you want? Well, at first, of course, 
you know, I, I shop this around in, um, to different publishers and, <clears throat> excuse me, and it, you know, it wasn't a blockbuster. Or they didn't, they felt it was kind of too regional. And I think it was uh, um, Libby Oldham. I don't know if those of you who know Libby was like, well, what are you waiting for? Just, just, you'd be waiting for, how, how many years are you going to wait to put this book out? So um, I asked a, a bunch of people on Nantucket who had self-published books. They gave me um, some great advice. And it was liberating in that um, I was able to, I remember Hobson Woodward, um, who used to work at the Inquirer Mirror, and he wrote a book uh, about uh, how Shakespeare got the idea for The Tempest. And I remember him telling me, he's like, the, co the covers they were choosing we, we just had nothing at all to do with the book. He goes, I had a fight to have the cover I wanted. And he goes, and it really wasn't the cover I wanted, but it was close enough. And so I, I thought of that, and I was like, gee, I can do any cover I want. So again, not to uh, mention her name too many times, I enlisted uh, my wife, who works pretty cheap, <laughs> and uh, she she painted the covers of uh, both books. So I was able to do that. In <clears throat> and <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Uh, and then inside, uh, uh, especially with the tourist, I was like, oh, I got all this freedom. I can do I can do whatever I want. And so I added poetry to it, and um, I didn't, um, any restrictions, I, I didn't self-edit. <laughs> People say that's obvious. <laughs> um, so it was freeing to be able to, you know, have the book go the way I wanted it to. And I think, I think the book came out better because I just, the shackles of uh, whatever were, were, were loosed. What is the what is the what's the what's the what's the the joy and what's the danger of? I mean, look at this is a book about your neighbors. Yeah. Right. It may not be exactly about them, but everybody who reads it gets it, right? Um, what's the joys and what are the difficulties of doing that? What of writing about? Um, writing about the people who live down the street, the people who might be related to you. Well, in, in uh, I don't know if the, in, this answers the question, but I did want to get across a sense of place. You know, pe people always say, write what you know, and I've certainly done enough jobs here. Not that I can't hold a job. Um, <laughs> um, that, you know, I kind of know this place or, or wanted, wanted to convey what it's like to be here for people, um, you know, who aren't on Nantucket. And even this weekend, um, hanging out with the uh, other writers, I mean, a lot of them had never been here before, and they're all like, is it always this way? I, and he was the, uh, and we were going to the White Elephant, and um, a couple of the guys were saying, like, is everybody always so friendly here? And I said, we don't see a lot of strangers. <laughs> <laughs> well, well but, we see too many of them in the summer. Right, um, but I wa so, so I wanted the book to convey a sense of place. So I, I hope that uh, comes across. And I, so, so Nantucket itself, uh, I wanted the, the, the island just to be a character as well. Because, you know, the island speaks to all of us in, in different ways. When you think of the artists who are out there uh, and, you know, people who have been writing about it for years, uh, people... Um, gladly coming here, not just on vacation, but, um, you know, coming here because um, of the history of the place and of the, of the people who have been here, you know. I, I'm on this stage right now and I'm, can't, I'm sitting with, you know, on the, oh, it's on the same stage as uh, Thoreau and Emerson and uh, Frederick Douglass and how wonderful today, uh, Juneteenth, to be on the same stage as Frederick Douglass uh, was here speaking to audiences and how <clears throat> but, but you also know a good deal of people in the audience so um, there's a thing I, might know a, I might know a couple 
<laughs> and and uh, your checks in the mail, by the way. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> there, there's a thing that I always found out about Nantucket, and everyone says, oh, most people who call me at work, if they're, and, and, and who bend my ear for 10 minutes about how much they love Nantucket, want something, right? But there are people who just live here, and it's like living anywhere. You stay in a place where you are because you like the people that you know. More, to me, there's a t tipping point where you like the people that you know more than you like the place. So that the place could eventually be any, although this is a beautiful place, it could be anywhere if, you, if those same people went with you. And you can feel that's what, that's what comes to, uh, that's the sense of place that comes to me through your book. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's there too. Good. So, thanks. Do you, do you, uh, uh, I know it's supposed to be a conversation, but I think a conversation with a writer would be, would be, uh, uh, would not be as much as it could if we didn't hear some, some of your book. Okay. So why don't you uh, find a place and start Okay. Uh, so um, I know a lot of you brought copies of your book. Turn to page. Uh. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not 11 o'clock mass. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I, I, um, uh, Joanne Skoken, who works at the drugstore, I, and I told her sister this. Um, when I said, hey, you're going to come to, I'm doing a talk on the book one, I said, Sunday at 11. Aren't you going to Mass? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I want to ask, how come you people aren't at church? Anyway. <laughs> well, well, now that you're, you're going to go to hell for that, you might as well entertain people on the way. Right. <laughs> right. What was it? Uh, Huck Finn said, uh, all the people will tell me that, what was it? I'm paraphrasing, wicked. Um, My, I can't well, hear you. You've got to oh, use your oh, mic. Oh. <laughs> Um, now, now you actually are only talking to me. <laughs> um, uh, what did Huck Finn say? Uh, that you know, that all the people with the, the, all the people that are telling him uh, uh, to to act this way and go to heaven. He's kind of like, I don't, I don't know if I want to go to that place if if these people are going to be there. <laughs> Uh, John's been talking, and John and I have been talking about uh, one of the characters, uh, Digit, and how um, proud he is of his her heritage. And before you start, tell everybody how, in the first book, you talk about how Digit got his nickname, which to me is, <clears throat> when my wife, was, who grew up here, was, uh, was you know, younger, a little girl growing up, everybody she knew had a nickname. Yes. Older men, men in their 70s had nicknames. And tell them, so it seems like a particularly Nantucket thing. Tell them how, how did you got his nickname. Well, and that was a thing. I mean, there are so many people here on the island who are known by, by their nicknames, and you don't even know their, their first name. Um, so I, it was just natural to have uh, this guy named Digit. Well, for, for one thing, uh, his first name is uh, Clarence. And... Um, so this is kind of a, it was an homage to uh, um, God rest his soul, uh, uh, Frenchy Doucette, who, who everybody knew him as Frenchy. And because he said, uh, well, he goes, yeah, they named me Clarence. And he goes, I was Frenchy from the day I was born. <laughs> so um, I didn't think Frenchy would mind that I had a character named Clarence and that, uh, but he didn't, um, oh, they, let me just go back. So when, when um, Digit was born, Clarence, and there was a conversation um, uh, among uh, his aunts and uncles, and like, uh, uh, why'd they name him uh, Clarence? And they said, well, they named him after uh, his father. Oh, I, I always thought his dad's name was Skip. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, I, not to ramble on too much. Okay, so this... You're, you're, uh, you're, here, you're here to ramble on. Um, oh, so Digit got his name um, in school because um, he was um, counting on his fingers in, uh, in, in grade school, and some kid goes like, oh, yeah, look at him. He can't even count. He just, you know, we should call him Digit, and the name stuck. So... And, and as I explained in this book, 
what Digit was going over in school in the uh, fourth or fifth grade. He was memorizing the periodic table of elements. So, <laughs> that Mr. Day always said, Mr. Day who taught at the high school always thought students should memorize the periodic table of elements, so that's where that came from, Bob. Anyway, as the long summer waned, see, some, some people do think the summer's long. As the long summer waned, Digit prepared his gear for scalloping, unfolding his chain netting, checking and replacing the wood bracing that defined each dredge. He still had to haul his, his boat to get her ready. He had to change the name of the boat, too. She remained the Claire Mar, a combination of his first name, Clarence, and Marsh's, that was his wife, the name all his boats had had ever since they first started going steady. It had seemed too abrupt to paint it over when Marsha first divorced him. He had become... <laughs> He had become as accustomed to the name as he had been to living with Marsha. But what was it now? Two years? Time to change the name. To what exactly would come to him in time? First things first, paint it over, then come up with a name. Yeah, and then now we, we get a sense of uh, Digit's life on the water. He loved the ocean, loved being out on it, part of it. When life on land became intolerable, Digit knew he could escape to the sea. He was lucky he had grown up on the water. He'd accompanied his father and grandfather so much, their knowledge practically slid off their oilers. He remembered being a toddler and waiting for his grandfather to return home in the late morning, early afternoon with his daily limit of scallops. He'd watched through the lower half of the glassed-in storm door for the old man's pickup loaded down with boxes of the ridge shell beauties. He stood on tiptoes as his grandfather unloaded his catch, lifting each large plastic milk crate type box off the back of the pickup, hauling it into the shanty and summarily upending it onto the long table-like workbench where the unpacked scallop spilled out. Digit knew to wait until all the boxes had been transferred. Then, with his mother's permission, He'd don his child's coat in his child-sized rubber fishing boots and head out to the shanty where his grandfather picked them up and deposited him on the bench. Then he'd watch his grandfather slip the cords of a black rubber apron over his head, grab a stainless steel bowl and his open his knife, and one by one open each scallop and deposit its sweet-tasting mussel into the bowl. The first scallops, however, had to be sampled by his grandfather, the muscles still pulsing as he popped it straight from his knife to his mouth. Digit knew to be ready. After a quick snack of several scallops, and with a steady hand and unerring aim, his grandfather flicked scallops straight into Digit's mouth, Digit anticipating each flying scallop as naturally as a gull. From her house window just beyond the shanty, Digit's mother took pleasure in witnessing these moments every day. After his grandfather had popped a dozen or so scallops into Digit's gullet, she knew he'd soon be hoisted down from the bench and sent home. Digit still preferred fresh, raw scallops to fresh, cooked scallops, and there were no better scallops than on Nantucket. But, like his grandfather, he only ate a few, if any, while he was opening. When he scalloped for a living, he seldom had them for supper. That would be cutting into his profits. <laughs> and, oh, thank you. Well, well, that's certainly a sense of place. Talk a little bit about, even with a passage like that, how do you go about writing it? Do you, do you put the character in it and let the character kind of go through that? Do you, do you, do you pull together... I mean, you worked in a scallop shanty for your, for your, for your father-in-law, right? Yep. So do you find moments like that and then pull them together and create moments on the page and then put a character into it? I mean, how do you do it? Uh, yes, I did that in a different scene, exactly what you're talking about, um, just um, taking different uh, vignettes from uh, times in the shanty. But that passage I just read was pretty much um, exactly what happened every day when... Um, my son's grandfather came home from scalloping, and that's ex 
that was the that was the thing. He'd wait for his opa to come home, and he'd go out into the shanty, and and it really was true. He flick scallops into his mouth and then he'd send it back home to his mother. But, <clears throat> excuse me, there, um, there's an another scene um, that we're uh, digits in the shanty and uh, his, his opener, oh, maybe I should try to find that. Sure. Oh, yes. can you see? <laughs> His open is quite a character in his, in, in his own right. Now, and when all these people are older in, 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 in uh, Nocturne, they have memories of this. It's not really what they, 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 they do those things anymore. Digit's best pal, like you say, went from 12 bus driving to working for the newspaper. Uh, it used to be a time when you could get any job you know, I moved here, got a job as a carpenter. I had absolutely no idea how to do that and absolutely no skills. But I didn't have a DUI and I owned a truck, so, yeah. you know. Um, it, it seems like everybody I know started out one job or another that way and then learned it as they went along. And so, the, and, and that's the beauty of living on Nantucket. And, and um, yeah, that if you, if you want to work, um, and people will take you on and teach you how to do it. Yeah. Cap. People of a generous, <laughs> generous spirited that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so here's another scene from the, uh, uh, the shanty. Uh, so uh, one of the characters, Addie, uh, is looking for um, Digit, and he figures he'll find him at the shanty. And um, so um, and, and Addie says, uh, I thought I'd buy a pound to take to Verona. That's his girlfriend. And Digit says, buy a pound? There's an apron, there's a knife, there's a bowl. You can open your own pound, which is kind of how it is in the shanty. Addie knew Digit wasn't kidding. Although he hadn't opened in a couple of years, the motions came back to him automatically. He wasn't fast, but he didn't cut into Digit's profits either. Roland entered. Now, Roland is Digit's opener. Oh, Christ, times must be desperate, he said, seeing Addie. Nice to see you too, Roland, Addie said. Step aside and leave the opening to the natives. Roland took up his usual spot at the end of the bench. Immediately, the scholars were flying. They opened in silence. Roland already had at least a pound in his bowl, while Addie, who'd started well before, had maybe a quarter of that. You guys ever hear about the robbery, Addie said matter-of-factly. What robbery, Digit said. If there's been a robbery, I'd have heard about it, Roland chipped in. No, this one happened years ago, Addie said. It was a treasure chest of some sort, locked in an old safe. The one the school kids were trying to figure out what was in it, Roland asked. I remember that. They all thought it had pirate gold in it. What about it? Nothing. I just thought it was interesting. You going to write about it, Digit asked. Write about it, Roland said as his hands continued their nonstop motion. You writing a book report or something? I thought you drove a tour bus. He works for the paper now, Roland, Digit said. Oh, Jesus, Roland said. Better be careful what I say. I ain't never been in that paper, and I never intend to. <clears throat> why not, Addie asked. Roland's comment took him aback, and he wasn't sure why. I don't need nobody twisting my words around. What makes you th so sure anybody would want to talk to you anyway, Digit, Digit said good night naturedly. Roland stopped opening for a moment. Remember that girl from the Cape paper came in here a year ago? Looking to write up something about scalloping? He, re he re uh, recommenced opening as though he couldn't talk without working, which is true. A lot of guys look like that. I think it was opening day or something. You'd gone out with George and had a double limit, and he was in here with us. I think Jimmy Caldwell was in here, too. Oh, yeah, Digit said, reaching for a scallop. She came by when we were unloading. I think George told her she could come by the shanty. He probably wanted to ask her out or something, Roland said. Well, she came in here asking her questions, and I wouldn't say a peep. She tried taking a picture, too. That's when I went out and emptied my barrel. Was her name Ellen, Addie asked. How in hell should I know, Roland said. Why, you want to ask her out, too? I've got a girlfriend, remember? Roland snorted, continue, continued opening in a way that said the conversation wasn't worth his while. Anyway, Addie exhaled. I guess they never caught whoever did it. I'd forgotten all about that, Digit said. 
didn't seem that important. He stopped and thought for a second. I do know this. It was right around the time Dirk Caspian got arrested. Maybe that's why I don't, didn't take much notice of it. Who, Addie asked. Oh, nobody you'd know, an old friend. He paused, his scallop knife still on the shell but unmoving. Well, he used to be a friend. Will you two stop yapping, Roland said. You're taking all the fun out of this job. Sorry, Roland, Eddie said as he put down his knife. I think I've got a pound here. As soon as I weigh these babies up, I'll be on my way. Just take them, Digit said. No need to weigh them. Eddie emptied his scallops into a plastic baggie and rinsed off his apron. Thanks, Digit. Good, good to see you, Roland. I'd say goodbye, but you'd probably put that in the paper, so I won't say anything. <laughs> Now, now as, as, as great as, as these little vignettes are, and I, the older I get, I think the more hap I'm just happy to read those little vignettes one at a time. But I do understand that novelists like to have a plot as well. Yes. So tell us a little bit about the plot. That, uh, plot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I, I couldn't find it, so you'll have to show me where it was. <laughs> It kind of sneaks up on you. I was, so, I was having such a good time hanging out with these guys, I didn't really want to. You know how when your friends have yeah. stupid plans and you walk away? When he started thinking of it, I just closed the book. Well, um, the, the plot basically is a, a treasure hunt. And um, there are uh, people with uh, nefarious um, means or the, that want to find this treasure chest, as well as since Addie's working for the newspaper and... Uh, he heard about this um, lost chest. Uh, he gets involved, and so it, it's not a comedy of errors, but we get a bunch of people in the island. They're out trying to find it, not telling the others, of course, what, what they're doing. And so it, that's kind of the plot. Sure. I see Barbara White over there sneaking around, going to give us the 10. He's going to give us the off-camera off, off call. Is it really already? Call. So should we, should, we, should we open up to some questions in the audience? Uh, sure, they're probably going to say, How many, can you, do you have to go 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> we, we should tell them which bar we're going to be at. They can meet us there. Um, any questions for Steve? Yes. <laughs> Steve, um, tell us three off-season uh, things that Islanders love. Wow, three off-season things that Islanders love. Well, um, one thing is, uh, okay, going to the stop and shop and not having to, um, you know, time it. You don't have to look at that. You can go whenever you want. Um, that's, that's one. Um, two, yep, same with the post office. Um, I think number two is... Uh, you know, really going to, go to the beach um, alone. And I know um, there is a leash law, but some people, they love the winter because they can let their dogs run on the beach. And it's, they know that, you know, they, and people know the beaches where there aren't going to be anybody going by. Um, and number uh, three, um, well, um, both my kids were born in the summer. Um. <laughs> so, so that can be good or bad. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess. Um, and uh, also, um, you know, a lot of people like to go hunting. Um, um, and um, oh, and also, uh, a re people really love to uh, read in the winter here and hunker down. Uh, with a book, and it's and, it's... and there was that moment, and I always thought it went around scallop season, which is why I love those passages you read so much, that this place becomes a small town, a small town again. Yes. Right? Um, whatever it is in the summer, it's, it's not really a small town. Exactly. Um, and it becomes a small town again, uh, for all the good and bad of that. Everybody yep. knows who you are, which is good and bad. Yeah, can be. Can be. <laughs> um, so, uh, anybody else? Yes.
absolutely, and it's a. Uh, in, in its uh, last real uh, fishing industry here, in um, you know, hopefully, um, with the with the fertilizer um, article that that passed, um, that that makes a difference. Um, hopefully, it might just be cyclical. The, I know the scallopers all talk about it. Um, and you ask the scallopers, what you know, how's the season going to be next year, and they say, you know, we don't know. They go, we really don't know anymore. Um, and not until we get out there. And th this season, they, this last season, they had predicted it was going to be bad. And um, a, a few guys were able to fish all season. Um, and the year before, was it the year before or two years before, um, there were so many scallops left uh, out there that they ex extended the season a couple of weeks because cause th those scallops would just die off anyway. So um, I guess uh, there's always hope, right? But the, the things do have to be done. And I know that's one thing um, that this island is very proactive in, in that. I mean, the Shellfish Association is just wonderful and uh, people care. The people really care about it. So. Um, as they do about so much on this island. I mean, when you look around at what's been preserved on this island that could have just, you know, gone away, it's it's And, and it's, part of it is there's, there's no one answer to the harbor, right? And there's no one answer to the almost devoid of scallops kind of situations in now compared to 15 or 20 years ago. And it's going to take time. There's no one answer, plus it's going to take a long time to, to, for any of these answers to show Right. To show, you know, uh, that, that they're working. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult right. thing. Most of the guys we know are, are old timers. Yep. So. And, 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 and if you haven't seen John's uh, documentary, uh, the, the Last Bay Scallop, it's just marvelous. And uh, it's really, really great. And, um, you go lo log rolling in our time. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, anything else for Steve? Yes. Well, uh, um, well, you know, God bless Brownie, um, and God bless El Tigre, and uh, Stevie Ryder, and they, they were all, you know, and they were all great characters, and where are those characters now? I mean, right? And, and People just knew them, and they, they were, you know, sure El Tigre would get into a fight sometime, but uh, that, that, that was part of it. And I remember <laughs> working at the looms, I had the, <laughs> you know, a, a, a bird's eye view of Brownie's rounds <laughs> every, every day. And it, it, yeah, it's true. You just, um, where are the uh, characters? Um, I, well, it's too expensive for them to live here anymore. Over the last I couple guess, of years, that's true. a half dozen of my old, old friends uh, all moved. Yeah. You know, they were, you know, they were guys you'd want to live next to. You know, they yep. were interesting guys to know, but they couldn't afford to live here anymore. I mean, when I, when I first moved here, you couldn't afford to live here maybe if you were on a painting crew, but now it's you can't afford to live here if you're a doctor at a hospital. So that's getting a lot. Or sadly, a, or yeah, sadly a teacher or yeah. a policeman or a yeah. fireman. Or, Forty but, positions open at the school because yeah. they can't. And that's what Shep, I can't call you Steve very much because I've always called him Shep from the first day I met him. Um, Shep was his last job was a school teacher. Yep. So he knows all the ups and downs of, uh, of that profession as well. We're getting told that we're uh, running out of time. Four minutes. There you go. Another question? Question. Uh, and, and with COVID, how, did, did any of the, what's going on in the last couple of years you were writing this book, in your personal life or in the life that we all had to deal with, did, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, um, with COVID, we couldn't, we, we weren't going anywhere. I was, you know, teaching uh, remotely, so um, 
you suddenly had all this time. So, yeah, that's when I wrote the majority of, of the book. I was like, well, I might as, might as well um, find a positive out of this and hunker down and write. But um, to, to your the question, Bob, it's, you know, the writing goes best when, I, when you have a set time and you, you adhere to it and you're disciplined and it, it really, if your mind kind of opens, it opens up and, and, you know, says, oh, yeah, this is what we're doing now. And, um, but am I organized enough to stick to, to, to that? I always say I've got to get on a real schedule here. Um, so it's so, like going on a diet. Right. Theoretically, yeah. we all want to do that. Is it going to work? No. Yeah. We also know where the, where the chips are. I just got to get more disciplined, as my wife can tell you, in, yeah. in many aspects. Do you, have a, do you have a set number of pages you like to do a day? Or? I, I, I like to do the, you know, write the magical thousand words a day, right? Blue, was, it, was that like a goal, right? Um, and, and so, yes, if I get a thousand words, um, I'm happy. Then, and yes, and there are times where I do, I'm like done, and I do the word count, 760 words, I'm like, <laughs> all right. And a lot of times I, I just, you know, go either, either take notes or, or um, as uh, Nat Benchley used to say, you like to leave a little window into the next day's work. You don't want to just uh, leave it, leave it hanging a bit, leave it that you can, you have something to, that you go right into and then start your next day's work. So I try to take that advice, too. All right, one last quick question from me. What are you working on now? I'm working on a new uh, book. This, as I said, this one has, um, we're introduced to new characters. Um, 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 and um, it's a murder mystery. So let me ask you this one last question. Um, Whatever happened to the great Brockton novel? I think I read a chapter of it once upon a time. Well, Steve Shep is actually from, although he's lived here, everybody knows him from here. Uh, he's actually grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts, and wrote what I thought was a, the chapter I saw was great. I, I, I didn't never really, I never know if it, where it went from there. Oh, th thanks. Well, that's still, um, that's, it, that's still a, a, to be continued. I mean, uh, hopefully, someday, the great Brockton novel will, uh, it does have its, it, well, it, 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 you know, it hasn't been written yet, so I thought I'd write it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that'll be a place that you won't have the luxury of writing about a place everyone loves. That'll be about Brockton. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, there were, well, there, 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 were parts, there were parts of Brockton to love. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you all thank so you. much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Great job. Thank you. It was great, man.